there and welcome to the channel. My name is Kaylee and if you are new here, welcome. You have reached our true crime section of our channel. Now, lately I have been become obsessed with Australian true crime stories. I've been spending so much time researching and looking into Australian true crimes that I thought I need an outlet, I need someone to talk to, so you guys are it. Uh, I love to have conversations in the comment section about the case that we're talking about, so please, if you have anything to add or say about the case that we're going to talk about today, add it in the comments below. In today's case, I want to talk about Jessie Kate, who was a young lady that was from Dawesbury in Western Australia. This is just, this is a very sad case. It's, it's heartbreaking, actually, so just be prepared for that. But I'm going to get straight into it so you can learn what happened to poor Jessie Kate. Jessie was born in March of 1996. She was the second eldest daughter born to Paul and Judy Kate. She was one of five siblings and the family were residing in Dawesville, Western Australia. Now she was described by her friends and family as being a well-loved and loving 15-year-old girl who had hopes of becoming a kindergarten teacher once she finished school. Now she had a part-time job and that was at the local Safeway which is our supermarket chain we have here in Australia but she was always making time for friends and family. In September of 2011, Jessie started dating Harley Murphy. He was 17 years old and the pair were really inseparable. Even though at the time of Jessie's death, they had only been dating for two months, all of their friends and family would always say how much of a loving relationship they had for each other, how they were inseparable, or if, if they were separated, they were texting or talking on the phone, and it was just a real, you could tell there was a real love there. In 2008, Judy and Paul decided to end their 15 year marriage and the pair separated. Now, Paul, he became very reclusive. Uh, he didn't have much contact with his ex-wife or their children. And the family have said that he really, he, he just became a recluse. They didn't talk, they didn't text. The relationship became very, very strained between him and his children and his ex-wife. On Monday, December 12th, 2011, Jessie is rostered on for work. So once she finishes school, her mum, Judy, drops her off at her job. And at, when she's dropped her off, her, Jessie tells her mum that she's going to catch the bus home. So she'll see her later on that night. Now, her shift ended at 6.30 that night. Uh, Harley, her boyfriend, then texted her at 6.35, which she did respond to. Uh, it was just a basic generic text message. There was no real information in it. And the last thing that was sent was, I love you. Now, when it got to around 8.30 p.m. and Jessie still was not home, her mum, Judy, uh, she knew that something was not right. She knew that the final bus had already, well, it had already gone past the bus stop and Jessie wasn't on the latest bus possible for her to come home. Of course, she reacted straight away. She rang the police uh, to issue a missing persons report. She rang other friends and family members to try and find out where Jessie was. Lots of Jessie's friends and family all tried to ring Jessie's mobile, sent her text messages and things like that, and there was just no response. Now, during all the call around and contacting people to try and find if anyone knew where Jessie might have been, Judy did get a call back. Uh, she got a call back from a person called Kyle Garth. Kyle Garth was 19 years old at the time and he was the ex-boyfriend to Emma, which was Jessie's eldest sister. Now, they had actually split up two months prior, but Kyle did also work at Safeway with Jessie. During the call to Judy, Kyle explained that he had actually seen Jessie and offered her a lift because of the horrible weather when he was leaving Safeway himself. Uh, he said, though, that he dropped her off at a park, which Judy just did not understand because if Jessie was going to change her plans for the evening, she would always text or ring her mum and let her know what was going on. As soon as Harley, Jessie's boyfriend, found out that she was classed as basically a missing person at this point, he and his friend Rob went and started walking the streets looking for Jessie, especially because Kyle had said he dropped her off at a park, so they thought that she could be stranded somewhere and they just basically went around looking for this poor girl all night. The next day was Tuesday the 13th of December and Kyle was brought in for questioning. Now he had already admitted to Judy on the telephone that he was quite possibly the last person to see Jesse alive the previous day by giving her a lift to this alleged park. It was only a matter of hours before Kyle actually cracked under the police interrogation 
and he did come clean about killing Jesse the night before. He admitted to picking Jesse up the night before from Safeway and when they were traveling home they got into a, a disagreement. Kyle said that he just seen red and during their argument he pulled the car over and started to choke Jesse. During this Jesse lost consciousness and Kyle decided that he was right to drive now so he continued on his journey. Then Kyle started to hear that Jesse was actually still alive. She was murmuring and starting to regain consciousness. Kyle then proceeded to pull the car over for a second time and choke Jesse again until she was no longer breathing. Now during this Kyle said that he lost complete self-aware and self-control. He said he could not explain why he did this to Jesse even though they were just having an argument but he just he just saw red and he couldn't control himself. I find that extremely hard to believe if Jesse was in fact choked to unconsciousness and then re-choked a second time you have enough time to calm down you have enough time to realize that what you're doing is ridiculous and you would you would think that you could just go no this is so wrong what am i doing now kyle continued to drive with jesse's body in the car at this point he went to tim thicket's boulevard which is a bit of a bush bushland area there's trees and shrubbery and things like that there um he took jesse's body out of the car and placed it in the shrubbery now he then got back in his own car drove 10 20 kilometers home and collected a shovel he then returned to Jesse's body and dug a shallow grave, trying to hide Jesse in this grave and then by covering it with uh, branches and leaves and things like that. And then after doing all of this, after everything that he's just done, he decided he'd go home and play video games with his roommate. So in May of 2012, Cole pleaded guilty to murdering Jesse. His defense team did lead the case with the fact that he had no criminal record. He didn't have any sort of tarnish against his name until this point. So in May of 2012, Cole pleaded guilty to murdering Jesse. One of the things that his defense team did put out uh, there was the fact that he had no criminal history and he had no tarnishes on his criminal record up until this point. The, his defense team also said that he was showing remorse, but to this day, Kyle has never actually issued an apology or a, and a statement for any kind of apology to Jesse's friends or family. So I'm not sure how they thought that he was showing remorse when the man has, has still not apologized to Jesse's family for what he's done. Now, just two days after Kyle had pleaded guilty to murdering Jesse, her father, Paul, he was found to have been killed himself. He had been in an altercation and assaulted and unfortunately he died as well. Now this was just another blow for Judy and her children. They had just lost their sister and even though Paul was not communicating with the family at this time, they still lost their father. Judy did say that Paul never came out of that reclusiveness that he'd put himself into. And even during uh, Jesse's funeral arrangements and all of that, during that really difficult time, Paul never came back to help the family or console them. And they really still had very, very minimal contact. In September of 2012, Cole was sentenced. He was given life imprisonment with the possibility of parole after 18 years. This means that he won't be eligible for release until 2029. I don't really know what else I can add to this case except for my deepest sympathy and condolences to the Kate family. I just, this poor girl's life was taken away at such a young age and she just, from everything that I've read, she seems like she was just a loving, caring person. I, it's just such, it's a tragedy that the good people are taken away. I, yeah, I just don't get it. Now, if you have already subscribed to our channel, thank you so much. It really does help our channel grow. And if you haven't already, please hit that subscribe button down below. I will be back in just a couple of days with another Australian true crime story. If you have a case that you would like covered on the channel, please drop it in the comments below and I will do my very best to research that case. And I hope to see you all in the next video. Bye.